en énorme 2001 Ça te rappelle rien Non Alors laisse-moi te rafraîchir la mémoire Hey what's up I'm KBHD here and this is the iPhone 12 and I feel like we've all seen an iPhone before at this point this is a pretty familiar iPhone we've seen the rounded corners and the notch and the lightning port but there are a couple key changes this year that are a first in the iPhone so I've been using this iPhone 12 for a bit since my impressions video and it's my favorite iPhone ever, mostly because of this design. But if you're considering getting one, there's some stuff you should know. Now I'm gonna do a separate video on the Pro in this sweet blue color. I think it's the best color, but these two phones are very similar. Same exact size, like a case that works for one, works for the other. Same main cameras, almost the same screen, same battery, same charging. But there's a couple things that only apply to the Pro, and I'll go over those in that video. But let's just start with the 12 with this new design, shall we? I love this super flat design. It is so flat. It's not the typical almost flat where the screen is flat right up to the edges and then it curves over the very edge and they call it like 2.5D. No, this is flat, flat. Like the phone happens to be a little bit thinner and a little bit lighter than last year, but I'm not as concerned with that. But the square sides are actually the most efficient way to pack in those internals into the phone as efficiently as possible. And I happen to think it looks and feels super premium and, and modern on top of all that. Now, this kind of red, but also kind of salmon sometimes product red version, after seeing it in person, I'd probably not go for this. I'd go for either the blue or the black, but yeah, those aluminum rails are everything. They're more grippable, maybe a little less comfortable at first, but hey, the buttons are clicky. The power button is a little bit bigger. It's still IP68 water resistant. You've got your 5G antenna cut out on the right hand side in some regions, which trust me, I'll get way into that in a second. And yeah, I just like holding this phone. Now, if you put a case on it, I guess a lot of that doesn't matter as much. You'll notice it less obviously, but still even some cases are flattening out their dimensions for the iPhone 12. So that again will make it easier to grip, harder to drop. And speaking of dropping, all these new iPhones come with on the front, something new called ceramic shield. And this is basically this specialty hardened kind of glass with crystal structure inside it. And it's on the front of these phones over the screen and it's supposed to offer four times better drop protection. So shatter protection basically, which is great. But I typically care just as much, if not more about scratch resistance, all the little micro scratches that your phone gathers over time. And the thing about scratch resistance is it's typically inversely proportional to shatter resistance. So if you think about it, the softer something is, the less likely it is to shatter, but then the easier it is to scratch it, and vice versa. The harder something is, the less likely you are to scratch it, but the more brittle it is and the more shatterable it becomes. So I see the headline of better drop protection, and that's great, but I'm not about to drop my phone to find out if it works. I'm sure people are already on that. I have no idea how they'll land on that 4X number, but all right. All I know is I already have a little gash in my screen on the left-hand side here, which is so sad, but that's probably at a level six. No idea how that happened, but I'm feeling like the iPhone is not significantly more scratch resistant than before. Of course, Zach will probably tell us the truth there. So if it shatters a lot less when dropped, we'll see. That would be nice. But I feel like a lot of the drop stuff is happenstance. Like if I happen to drop my phone a certain way, it's definitely gonna crack, right? And if I happen to drop my phone another way, it's probably not going to, so I don't know. I don't wanna worry about too much. Use a case if you want to, use a screen protector if you really want to. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna live my life. So the possibly the biggest external hardware feature of the new iPhones is MagSafe. And I think it has bigger implications for the future of the iPhone, but right now MagSafe is the optional new magnetic charging accessory standard on the back, like right behind the Apple logo. So the number one MagSafe accessory that Apple sells is the puck charger. It doesn't come with a brick, by the way, so if you buy the charger, 40 bucks, make sure you have a USB-C charging brick. But uh, yeah, just kinda slaps onto the back of the phone, you line it up with the magnets, you kinda get used to where it places right over the Apple logo, and that's all good. This charges at 15 watts, while every other wireless charger on the iPhone still charges at seven and a half watts. And a couple other FAQs on this. Number one, yes, it is still Qi charging, so you can still charge the iPhone 12 with other wireless chargers, and you can charge other phones with the MagSafe puck if you're into that. Number two, 
The durability concern with MagSafe leaving marks on the iPhone, I have noticed that on mine too, but I don't think it'll turn out to be a long-term problem. It just seems to wipe off every time. Like you might remember how the HomePod was leaving these little white stain rings on certain wood tables, which is kind of understandable because not every table is the same, but I feel like, I guess I hope, Apple's probably tested this like 100,000 times and probably determined that it's not an issue about the way they made this, so should be okay. And then number three, I was getting a lot of questions about this. Yes, you can MagSafe charge through most non-MagSafe cases as long as they're thin enough. And even that magnet will actually still work through some thin cases. So I didn't really have any non-MagSafe cases here to test, but of course, channel sponsor Dbrand sent over a grip case and I can confirm it's thin enough to work just fine with a MagSafe charger, kinda like it is a MagSafe charger. And yes, all the other benefits of a case, grippiness, protection, they all still apply. So since I know most people end up looking for a good one, I'll leave a link to this case below. Now at the beginning of this MagSafe bit, I said something. I said it was optional, which it is for now, but I feel like we can all sort of see where this is going, which is Apple is slowly moving towards eventually making a portless iPhone, which I think that's a whole separate video's worth of rant, but bottom line is their solution to wirelessly conveniently charging a phone that doesn't have a port is gonna be MagSafe, this thing right here. So, eh, it's not amazing, but I guess it's fine. The couple of accessories they've made for it so far, not bad. There's a regular case, of course, so you can continue to stack things through. There's a kind of weird looking clear version of the case for some reason. Uh, there's a, a wallet that I mentioned that doesn't have very strong magnets, but if you think about it, it's not so peculiar that the one accessory they chose to make outside of the case is a wallet. Like, let me know if there's any flaw in this, this series of logic, right? So Apple wants to get rid of the port on the iPhone and go totally wireless charging for everything at a certain point, maybe next year, whatever, right? So they already see ahead of time this particular headline, which is people who use wallet cases can't wireless charge their iPhone. So they can't charge their iPhone at all. So Apple needs to invent a way for people who use wallet cases to continue to charge their phone. So they invent an accessory, which is a removable wallet bit, so you can charge the phone, and when you don't need to charge it, you can put the wallet back on. That seems to check out. Like I said, it's a whole thing, but today, optional. Battery life on these phones has actually been pretty good, but not noticeably better than last year at all. Matter of fact, it's actually a slightly larger, higher res display and actually a smaller physical battery. So it's pretty impressive that the phone still does okay. You can kill it in a day with six hours of screen on time or just a lot of heavy use, but this isn't new with this standard size iPhone. If you want a real battery champ, you can go for the bigger phone. The actual best new piece of the iPhone 12 though is definitely the new display. It goes from being that 720p LCD with bigger bezels that was really easy to make fun of to this much better and even slightly bigger 6.1 inch 1080p OLED. It's like night and day. It's basically on par with the Pro, which is actually pretty surprising to me, just a slightly lower peak brightness. Now it's 60 Hertz again. And while that's kind of a missing feature at this point on an $800 phone in 2020, I was actually kind of expecting that. I was just thinking the pros would get 120 Hertz displays this year, but obviously none of them did, which is a bummer. But let's be honest, they probably saw that as a battery saving measure since this phone did also just get 5G. So let's talk about 5G. I kind of love and hate 5G right now. So this slogan, Apple, and I guess the carriers too, really keep pushing that 5G just got real. 5G just got real, really? Just now, 5G just now got real? Last time I checked, like this year, I reviewed like 30 phones with 5G. So clearly 5G has already existed, but there's a reason they're saying it this way. So first of all, I did a video all about 5G where I went to a 5G area, testing it, explaining it, showing what's good about it and what its limitations are. I'm gonna leave it linked right below the like button if you wanna watch it, catch up on that. But the bottom line is it's really promising, but it's still being built right now. But carriers, and I guess Apple, really like the message that 5G just got real because now that all of the new iPhones have 5G built in, there's about to be millions and millions and millions more people walking around with 5G capable phones in a few very short months. 
And when that happens, that tends to accelerate development. That sort of makes it real, which I get it. But also the carriers would very, very much like you to upgrade to their 5G plan, please. But we gotta remember, 5G in 2020 has its ups and its downs. Like this iPhone 12 I'm using here has Verizon 5G, which is surprisingly actually in my area. It's not millimeter wave, it's not ultra wideband, but it can still give me roughly 20% faster download and upload speeds. But 5G radios are also pretty power hungry. And the more time you spend on 5G, the more battery you bleed through. Now, Apple's thought a lot about this, of course. So their solution, and you might have caught it on stage during the announcement, is called Smart Data Mode. And basically, it tries to only use 5G when you actually need it to save battery. So when you're in a 4G area, you're on 4G speeds, everything works with LTE, no problem, you're good. It'll feel normal. When you're in a 5G area, and you're doing a lot of bandwidth intensive stuff. You're downloading a bunch of videos and music, you're FaceTiming in crispy HD. You're doing a lot of that high bandwidth stuff. That's gonna use 5G and that's gonna improve that experience a lot. But if you are in a 5G area, but not really doing anything that benefits from 5G, then your phone will actually switch off and stick with 4G. And as The Verge reported, it'll actually still show you the 5G indicator in the corner but you'll get 4G speeds, which we'll probably find, but that also explains this sort of weird speed test result. So look, my take is, I get it. The best technologies are supposed to be invisible. Like you shouldn't even notice they work. You go to download something while walking around, you're in a 5G area, boom, 5G turns on, your downloads go super quick, and then it turns off to save battery. It's kind of like ProMotion on the iPad Pro, it goes, up to 120 hertz when you're scrolling and playing games and actually using it. But when you're not, you're just sitting on the home screen or watching a video, it will go down to 24 hertz to save battery. So it's sort of not there when you don't need it, it's there when it helps you. It's just weird that <laughs> the whole messaging has been in your face 5G, 5G, 5G. 5G, 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 5G. So yeah, I would say don't buy this phone now because you wanna get a 5G phone. But if you do get this phone now, then maybe it'll be a nice bonus if you're in a 5G area or in the future when you end up in a 5G area, you'll be able to use that too. Cool. Kick, snare. Kick, snare. All right, new iPhone equals new best camera ever in an iPhone, right? Well, sure, iPhone 12's got a slightly updated dual camera system with a standard and an ultra wide. The standard has a slightly wider aperture at f1.6 instead of f1.8. And to be honest, <laughs> it's not really much of a difference in the camera, like it's just not. Same as the Pixel, they're not really doing anything too drastic. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Really, the hardware improvements are almost impossible to notice in regular photos, but they will get you an improvement in like the edge cases, the most difficult photo and video taking scenarios. So like handheld in low light, that'll be better. Night mode will be better. Autofocus on fast moving subjects, uh, super high dynamic range shots, like shooting straight into the sun, thanks to smart HDR3, stuff like that. Other than that, it still looks like iPhone photos, which is to say some of the absolute best and most consistent crisp photos on any smartphone. So that's not a letdown, but iPhone video though, firmly in a league of its own. It firmly, like every time I test a new iPhone camera, it, it's just, the video camera is so much better and people care a lot about video, they take a lot of videos, so you'd wanna know, yeah, the iPhone takes great video. And that's despite not shooting 8K and not having a huge new sensor or anything crazy like that, it's just so fine tuned and so reliable. But I wanna save my full analysis of that for the video about the pros because I think pros care even more about video stuff and there's potentially, well, there's even new hardware of the sensors in the 12 Pro Max, so that could be interesting to see. My one knock is it does seem like there's more flaring in low light video, like just a ton of little orbs for every little point light source, but it's still very usable though. Now you might've heard about Dolby Vision HDR. These new iPhones are the first cameras, the only cameras in the world to shoot 10-bit high dynamic range Dolby Vision 4K video and that's awesome, HDR video is awesome. Higher, brighter brights, deeper shadows, overall better images, even better perceived quality. I love HDR. But here's the thing, Dolby Vision is just one HDR standard or format by Dolby and there are other HDR standards that have been out, you might have heard of, HDR10 is one of them. 
and that some other smartphones have actually started enabling you to shoot. You might have a smartphone in your pocket right now that is already capable of shooting HDR10 video. But the issue with new formats is always compatibility. So some TVs are HDR10 certified, some aren't. Some displays are Dolby Vision certified, some aren't. So you can look at the display, the video you take on the iPhone and it's Dolby Vision certified and it looks amazing. And if you send this video to another iPhone 12, it'll look amazing on that iPhone. But as soon as you upload it to Twitter or Instagram or TikTok or kind of anything at this point, even YouTube, it doesn't show up as that HDR on most people's screens, it's back to SDR. But the big deal here again is kind of like 5G, because there's about to be so many iPhone 12s in the world, there's about to be millions of new devices and new people out there shooting tons of HDR video and looking to share it. And so now there's more incentive for places and, and apps like Twitter and Instagram and TikTok to support HDR. So maybe the tagline should have been HDR just got real. Anyway, the rest of the iPhone is pretty familiar and that's a good thing for most people. iOS 14, we've all seen it by now, it's familiar even though there's a couple bugs and apps that will probably get updated pretty soon. Face ID, it's completely unchanged. Even performance is familiar since there's nothing super new like high refresh rate. There is the new A14 Bionic inside, which is one of the very first five nanometer chips in any device, which is a more powerful CPU and GPU and is paired with four gigs of RAM and everything's great. But that's mainly for speed that you're going to notice later down the road when the phone is two, three, four years old and hopefully still feeling really fast. But fundamentally, there isn't really that much of a difference in these iPhones and the performance you get this year versus what last year didn't already do. Just a little bit faster. But yeah, even at a somewhat premium, 830 bucks, that's the actual price. Apple's website shows carrier pricing at first, so it's a little misleading, but even at that price, yeah, this phone with best-in-class cameras, best-in-class performance, much better screen is pretty damn good. It's, this is the one to get for most people. Here's a too long didn't watch version for those of you lazy people that I know just went down to the chapters and skipped to this. It's a great phone. The best new parts of it are definitely the display, which was a huge knock up from last year. Knock up, why did I say it like that? The display is better, battery life's about the same, cameras are a little bit better, build quality and design are also an awesome improvement, and MagSafe, it's optional for now, but might as well start getting used to it. And the worst part is the price is a little higher because also 5G is built into the phone even for people who are never gonna use it. But that being said, there you have it. Great work, Apple. And definitely stay tuned for the review on the Pro. I wanna dive into what makes it a Pro. You know, as a, as a YouTuber, I think a lot about this. As a content creator, am I a Pro iPhone user? I don't know. There's a lot to talk about there, but that's been the iPhone 12. Thanks for watching. Much coming up very soon, because you know, Techtober, guys. Techtober. Catch you guys in the next one. Peace.